Уважаемые гости, добрый вечер. Разрешите, пожалуйста, от всего открытого университета Сколково поприветствовать вас сегодня здесь на лекции уникального содержания и представить профессора хирургии, заведующего хирургическим отделением, председателя Института глобальных инноваций в области здравоохранения Имперского колледжа Лондона Лорда Ардарси. Вау, я начинаю. Там мы. Во-первых, добрый вечер всем. И спасибо, что меня здесь сегодня, в этом очень видеть как это. We have many of these old lecture theatres in, in, in the UK and uh, it's always great fun when I go to the US. Everything is new, they never have old lecture theatres. Uh, and uh, so it's always nice to be presenting in something like this. You can hear even the acoustics, how wonderful they are. So uh, uh, thank you for having me here. Uh, I'm going to share with you my own personal research work, what I do. Uh, some of you may know I'm a clinician, I'm a surgeon, I operate on patients uh, and I also have an academic role. I hold the chair of surgery at Imperial. My academic interest is uh, mostly in technology. I'm a failed engineer. I wanted to do engineering but I ended up doing medicine for some, wrong, some reason and uh, then when I started practicing medicine I wanted to be an engineer again, so my, all my research is engineering. So I'm going to share with you how engineering and medicine coming together are having a tremendous impact on the way we deliver healthcare as a surgeon. I'm going to show you some of the work we've done in my own department, working with some very, very bright scientists and engineers, mostly in areas of minimally invasive surgery and robotic surgery. So, how many in this room is a doctor? Uh, okay. So, you're a minority. That's a relief. How many of you have qualified doctors? Or you are students? How many of you are students? You're all medical students. Okay, so that's the confusion, was it? The students didn't raise their hand because they didn't think they're a doctor anymore. Okay. All right, and how many years is your medical student years? One year? Two years, six years, oh, that's a different, are they different medical schools? Oh, oh you go to university and then do medical school after. How, ma how long is the, how many years to become a doctor? How many? Six years to become a doctor. Yes, that's right. I know, I know. I'm a doctor. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so you need six years to be a doctor, and then you need more years to become a specialist. Is that correct? How many years to become a specialist on average? Two. You can be a surgeon in two years? No. Three? Five. Okay. There you are. Okay. I took eight. Uh, and that was short. Most UK training, you train for another 10 years after you become a doctor to become a surgeon. So it's a long, long time. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you about surgery. How many of you will do surgery in years to come? Do you know? No? Few. Oh, there's a lady there. Good, good. We need more women to do surgery. Very important. Because women have very delicate hands, fine fingers, they move very nicely, and they could do better surgery. Do you believe that? I'm going to show you some evidence to support that. Okay, let's go about surgery. A lot has happened in surgery over the years, but I think I'm going to take you back to a seminal moment in which modern surgery was created. 
And the reason I'm going to give you this example is because if you're going to be an innovator in your life, you need to understand, you need to work with, as a doctor, you need to work with scientists. If you want to make change happen, if you want to come up with a new discovery, you need to be working as a part of a team. 100 years ago, doctors work on their own. Now you cannot deliver healthcare if you don't work as part of a team. So modern surgery, the way it happened, was quite an interesting thing. Because if you look at those who contributed to modern surgery, or the visionaries and the pioneers of modern surgery. Now, there was this guy here. This is in the US, probably the only old lecture theater they ever had, which is in the MGH. This is Massachusetts General Hospital. And this is Morton. Morton contribution to modern surgery is that he discovered ether. In actual fact, he didn't discover ether. Someone else discovered ether well below him. But he's the guy who used ether uh, for some reason, and he realized that that put him to sleep. So he started to use it on patients. So that was an interesting thing which happened in Boston. In Europe, uh, anyone knows who this is? This is a very famous surgeon called Bill Roth, who was in Vienna, who was real main interest was surgical instrumentation. Uh, and he developed most of the surgical instruments. And believe it or not, nowadays, we use, still use some of these instruments. And there were many Russian contributors in those days who also designed many, many surgical instruments. In actual fact, there was a very famous Russian surgeon in the 1950s who designed surgical stapling devices. Have you ever seen a stapling device? I actually still have the old stapling device with Russian letters on it uh, in the early 1950s. Very interesting story, this. This guy was so happy about his technology, which was great, he went off to the US on a long, long trip to present his work. And someone at the meeting, a chap called Leon Hirsch, who was an, a, an American entrepreneur, I think paid him a very small amount of money, bought the patent from him, and built a multi-billion dollar industry on the back of stapling. So if you go and look at J&J &J and Ethicon Autosuture, that was, that was a Russian surgeon who put that together, an academic actually, uh, working with a physics department in Russia. I can't remember his name, he, uh, 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 but you can do a search, you can find it. This is another interesting character whose name was Verkov. Verkov's contribution to surgery is when a surgeon took a tissue out, he used the microscope to analyze the tissue, which was what we call pathology or histopathology. And then finally, does anyone know who this guy is? He was another lord. He was called Lord Lister. He worked in King's College London, and he's the guy who introduced aseptic technique into surgery. He's the guy who introduced hand washing into surgery. In other words, sterility into the surgical field. So, these were different groups working in different parts of the world and combining their work together is really what created modern surgery as we know it today. And it's only a century old. It's about a hundred years old. No more, no less. Before that, we didn't really have modern surgery as we know it today. Now, what's interesting about modern surgery is some of the refinement that happened within that century. Uh, and and some of the major revolutions that happened in that era. What attracted, and most of us are lucky in our time, and most of you will be as graduates, something will happen during your career that is disruptive, that revolutionizes what medicine is doing. In my time, it was keyhole surgery or minimally invasive surgery. Have you heard of that term? And that happened for me in the 1980s, late 1980s and the early 2000s. And that was based on a very interesting philosophical approach to surgery. Surgery, when I was a medical student, like you, was done through a very large incision. Yeah? Big incision. And when we talk about the trauma of surgery, most of the trauma of surgery was inflicted by the surgeon. The big cut. Okay? And then there was another trauma when, in actual fact, they did the operation inside. 
but the incision trauma was a significant component of it. When I was in training, when I was stuck doing an operation, my boss used to come and make the incision bigger. Always made the incision bigger. It was the macho way of doing surgery. How many senior surgeons are in this room? Anyone? Yeah, but you're too young. You're not serious enough. Any? There we are. You're probably my age. Yeah, you probably have seen, seen it both. But, you know, some of the older surgeon in this room will tell you big incision was the way to do surgery. Now, the trauma of the incision is significant, as you can see here. Big, big cut. And then there is the trauma of the operation itself. And in this case, this is a cardiac surgeon opening the chest to get access to the heart because they want to fix something inside the heart. And the something that is wrong inside the heart is that tiny hole. You see it? This is a congenital hole between the right side of the heart and the left side of the heart. So you can imagine what the surgeon has done to close this hole. He made a big cut in the chest, open up the ribs, okay? Open up the heart as well to go after this tiny hole. Doesn't make sense, does it? That is what surgery was all about. Mac maximally invasive, yeah? It's a bit like, uh, it's a bit like throwing a big bomb to kill a rat. Does that make sense? Huge trauma uh, to get the access to that. So what keyhole surgery was all about is a change of mindset. How could we reduce the physical and the psychological trauma of surgery by combining modern technology and surgical innovation? So this is where Karl Langenbusch, a German surgeon, in 1882, did the first gallbladder operation. Nearly 100 years later, okay, we started to do this keyhole operation, no big incision, using a tiny camera here, putting gas and removing the actual gallbladder. And that's really how keyhole surgery started at the time. Now, has anyone seen keyhole surgery in operating theater? Any of you have? Hands up. Right, okay. Did the surgeon ever tell you it's good or bad or what? Or It's good, it's good for the patient. But believe it or not, it wasn't very good for the surgeons. And let me explain to you why. Because the challenges were tremendous. This is what a surgeon did in open surgery, an incision, put the hands in. You can feel everything. Suddenly, you substituted these probably best designed surgical instruments, human hand. It is the best designed instrument. No one has actually duplicated these instruments yet. With these instruments, which are longer and thinner, and during the operation, the surgeon lost some very important cue, and that cue was the feel. Yeah? Surgery is all about feeling the organ you're operating on. So you've removed the tactile feedback. Okay. The other thing the surgeon has lost, because you're looking at his television screen, you've lost the stereo image. You're operating in a 2D environment. So, surgeons, your bosses are very clever, they will tell you they're very, they could do anything. But you take two cues away from a surgeon, they fall apart. Very, very difficult. It makes the operation much more challenging. So, I'm going to tell you today what we've done in this era. In other words, how could we enhance the ability of a surgeon to operate using either the cognitive aspect, the perceptual aspect, and the motor control? This is what happens in an operating theater. This is me looking at a screen, and we are trying, most of our research has been based on these different areas. This is robotic surgery, which has really drove some of the changes. This happened about 10 years later. I started keyhole surgery in the late 80s, early 90s, and this started in the early 2000s. More than 10 years ago, we started this program. And this was a system uh, which was designed at the time, called them, it's called the Da Vinci system. I don't know whether you've seen it. It's a master-slave manipulator. This is the uh, slave. This is the master station where the surgeon sits. You get, what's unique about this, you get the 3D image back. 
why robotic became popular because the surgeons started to see stereo again. And then the instruments have six degree freedom of movement. Go and talk to your engineering colleagues, they will tell you what six degree freedom of movement is. It's actually it's equal to a human wrist. So the instruments could move in the same way as a human wrist. Where the old keyhole instruments had four degree freedom of movement, so you couldn't move them in the same way. Now, in this robotic platform, people think it's a real robot. This is not a real robot. What's the definition of robots? You probably do know. One of the first industrial robots came out of, again, Poland and Russia. Do you remember that? Have you ever read history of the robots? Yeah? So, give me a definition. What is a robot? Machine. I know it's a machine. Yeah. Huh? Yeah, it does solve problem. A robot, the way the purist will define robot, are machines capable of independent activity. Okay? It has to be independent. So they work in car assembly lines, they work in airline assembly lines, and they do repetitive things. Here, it's not the robot doing the operation, it's the surgeon doing the operation. Does that make sense? And that's the big difference. So robot is the bad word to use. And actually, in fact, it frightens patients when you say we're doing a robotic procedure. This is a master slave manipulator. That's what it is. Yeah? And what's unique about this, when this came to the operating theater, something very special happened. It's the first time we had a digital technology in the operating theater. We had a digital chip in the operating theater. And that really opened up a wealth of opportunities for us for research, including the use of imaging, preoperative imaging, MRI images, and augmenting those on video images during robotic surgery, controlling the zones in which a surgeon could operate in, uh, and also managing the post-operative care. And I'm going to give you examples of work we've done in this whole arena, which is very unique, very novel. For us, it's very unique and very novel, but for you, this will become normal clinical practice in years to come. Let's start with a very small operation in, uh, it's not a small, it's a big operation, robotically assisted cardiac surgery, doing bypass. This is a, a little video that shows you what happens. These are the robotic instruments. This is the fork that stabilizes the heart, and you can see we're doing a tiny operation. Now, there are a number of problems here. What are the problems? The heart is moving. Very difficult to do very fine stitching when the heart is moving. In the old days, we used to put the patient on a heart and lung bypass. Do you know what happened when the patient woke up for six weeks? Complete loss of memory and a cognitive dysfunction. Okay. So we took that away, and we're asking a surgeon to do very, very fine suturing during this very difficult, challenging heart moving at the same time. And we're also working in very, very small working spaces. So one of our first ideas, and this is what science is all about, and you guys are going to be doctors. Keep your brains at the end of medical school, because something happens to you all in medical school. You're taught to with blinkers, you know? When you finish, always ask the question, could I do this better? Could I actually improve the technique that I'm doing? If you don't do that, you become your own slave. Does that make sense? Very, very important, remember that. And when you have a question, go to the science lab and ask many of good scientists around you, engineers, very clever people. I have this problem, I think I could do this better. Could you help me? That's how scientific discovery happens. You probably do know, I've, I've spent the last two days in Skolkova. That is what Skolkova is supposed to be all about. How do we encourage bright people like you to be out-of-the-box thinkers? Does that make sense? And historically, Russia had some amazing science. It still has, by the way. You just need to explore that a little bit more. So the idea we had was, and the challenge for me was, could we do this operation without putting the patient on a heart bypass. And the challenge was, 
give me a static image for me to do the suturing. Not for me, I'm not a cardiac surgeon, but for the cardiac surgeon. So, what we did, an interesting bit of study here, we tried to see whether we can actually capture the depth of the tissue that the surgeon is looking at. And if we knew the tissue characteristics with preoperative MRI, we might be able to calculate the depth and move the scope at the same speed as the, as the, as the moving heart. And let me just show you how we do that. This is how we did it. We used eye tracking equipment. You can see here. What we do is we shine a bit of a laser energy to the back of the eye and then we can capture the reflection and we can track the eye movement. This is eye tracking. Me looking at you, I have circadian movements and a fixation point. Does any of you remember the physiology of the eye? Have you done physiology? Do they teach you physiology here? We've given up teaching physiology back in the UK. Awful, terrible. They keep changing the curriculum. Do they teach you anatomy? Very good. So, if you look at an image, the way I'm looking, screening, the eye moves in circadian movements and has different fixation points. And this is the technology that has been used in other industries, mostly, believe it or not, in marketing, sales and marketing. Why do some people buy uh, certain things and not on the other? So we put these things on the eye and we track the eye movement and you can see how the eye movement is tracked. Now this is what we've done in operative surgery, shine the line, pick up the sensor, and then you can actually measure the depth of the actual tissue. I hope this is going to work. And this is the way, just to show you, this is our uh, little uh, lab robot. Okay? And you can see we fixate to this tip. So the surgeon moves this and the tip moved. But what's unique about this here is that once we have the measurement of the depth, you can clearly see the computer calculate the depth and makes the lens of the camera moved at the, same, at the same speed or keep the same distance away from it. You probably say, where is this all going? I'll show you. Now, we can also track both eye movements. If you track both eye movements, then you are able to measure the depth of that tissue. Is that moving? Is it? Yeah. So, we instigated two sensors here to track the eye movements and then we can measure the, con because we all have a focal point, we can actually measure the conversions and then measure the fixation point and how far that is from the tracking device. And this is where we ended up with some of our early studies and this is the XYZ coordinates. Once you can measure the depth, you can actually, uh, you can see the fixation point here, you can reconstruct the depth of that tissue and the whole idea is to move the scope at the same time. And this is what we have. We did some early studies uh, looking at the depth recovery from uh, I think, what is it, five different subjects and comparing that to the real depth and you can see a very nice correlation between the depth recovery. How does it work? This is how it works. This is back to the coronary artery bypass. This is the left eye, this is the right eye and we're tracking the eye movements of the surgeon. We are recovering the depth of the tissue. We know the tissue characteristic. And as you can see here, we're recovering the depth of that tissue during that operation. And then we move the scope at the same time as the beating heart and display to the surgeon a static image. Does that make sense? Probably not, does it? Have you ever been in a car? Do you remember when you were kids, when you were in the car in the back and mom and dad were driving? and you are on the motorway and you see a car beside you and you look at it and say, the car looks static, but you're moving because you're both moving at the same speed. It looks like you're actually standstill, you're not moving. So you're tricking the eye in believing that the image is static. Yeah? And then you're moving the instruments, not just the scope, but you're moving the instruments at the same speed. So the surgeon sees a static image. And that is the whole concept of motion compensation, which is mostly to do with computer science and knowing the tissue that you're operating on. This is fantastic because we didn't tell the anaesthetist the first time we're doing this, so the anaesthetist looked at the screen and he thought the heart has stopped. 
that was an exciting moment to, to wake up the Nisus at the time, yeah? So, what else we're doing in that field? Back to perception we talked about, cognition. I'm going to show you some of the other areas of surgery which is really catching on, and that is this image augmentation. In neurosurgery, you probably do know, and a lot of this work, again, was done in Russia many, many years ago with MRI and others, is the ability to image a patient preoperatively and then reconstruct the brain and superimpose it on the skull before the neurosurgeon starts an open craniotomy. That was a very important anatomical landmark. And we want, the, the, it was easier to do in the brain because the head doesn't move. You can fix the head, where the abdomen and the chest does move because you have a heart beating and you're breathing in and out, yeah? So the ability to see beyond the surface was a very, very important one. And what's happening in the era of lung surgery? How many, how many of you smoke in this room? Ah, uh, no one's gonna have hands up. One, you better give up. Uh, and, uh, oh shit, you better give up too. Uh, doctors are the worst offenders. You know that? And the worst offenders, the doctors, uh, in smoking. And uh, so, the reason I'm showing you, because we now started in the UK to screen for lung cancer. Okay? And when you screen for lung cancer, you could pick up tiny little lesions, about two or three millimeters, sometimes up to five millimeters or even 10 millimeters, and you don't know how to manage them. Difficult to biopsy. And if you have an index of suspicion that this might be cancer, which you may not, you tend to go in and remove half the lung or all the lung. That is what used to happen. But now, with keyhole surgery, we can actually remove half the lung again, but why, do, why remove half the lung? Why don't you remove that tiny area? The problem with the lung is that it's like having a tiny pea. Do you know what a pea is? A green pea that you eat this, that size in the middle of a big sponge. How we define it without slicing and cutting and everything. So the whole area here of image augmentation is we can, re, we can know what the preoperative images are, reconstruct them, and superimpose them on top of the lung during that operation. And this is what's happening here. You can see during the robotic operation, we're displaying to the surgeon where that tiny little lesion is to allow the surgeon to remove that area only with a normal peripheral margin. Yeah. The other area we're looking at is haptic, in other words, tactile feedback. Because even in robotic surgery now, we don't have a tactile feedback. You're sitting on the master station, you're operating, you don't actually feel the tissue you're hitting. But you compensate that by having visual 3D image uh, and also knowing your anatomy. Does that make sense? So one of the areas we did, which is again based on this concept of gaze contingent, haptic constraint is, if we use the operative MRI image, pre -op, you see prior to surgery, most people have CT scans and MRIs. If you can reconstruct some of these images and identify the anatomical landmark and then display them in this funnel shape area, which allows the surgeon only to operate in that funnel shape area. It's something called forced constraint. The military use it. In other words, they give you a tiny zone, which is the green zone, in which you can actually target something, but you cannot go outside it. So if the surgeon operates in that field, he cannot injure the nerves around, which are important, for example, in robotic surgery. One of the operations we do is called prostatectomy for prostate cancer at a young man in their 50s, and you cure them of cancer, but they end up being impotent and that is not a good operation to do. So being able to visualize the nerves and make sure that the surgeon does not injure the nerves during their operation is quite important. Where is surgery going? This is Carl Langenbusch, okay? This is 1990, laparoscopic surgery. This is where we are now, what we call intraluminal surgery or incisionless surgery. Telescope comes in through the mouth, into the stomach. You make a hole through the stomach, and you come out of the stomach into the tummy cavity. Yeah? Like a snake. And you go in, 
and you do your operation inside the abdominal cavity. And we in our unit have done three patients by not going through the mouth but going transvaginally and removed the gallbladder of that patient without a single incision on their skin. That's where it's heading. It's heading to incision-less surgery. Now that is a paradox. Do you understand why? What, who, who speaks Latin? Latin? Come on, one person. What does surgery mean in Latin? Huh? What does the word surgery mean in Latin? Huh? Hand. No, it doesn't. It means a cut. Do you know that? Yeah. It means a cut. So, incision-less surgery is a paradox. Surgery itself is a cut. So, doing an operation without a cut is an, is an interesting concept. Huh? Conflict? Another view? Okay. So, some of the work we've done recently is how do we develop some of these instruments. And uh, some of these include imaging, but also we're including some very, very new, exciting diagnostics to this operative field. This is a program which is funded by the Wellcome Trust in the UK. It's called the Eye Snake Robot, which is for intraluminal surgery. And you can see inside, it's not just the working channels, in other words, the instruments, but also imaging and histopathological challenge uh, 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 devices for optical biopsies. But also, as I met a very good professor here from yesterday, we're talking about spectroscopy. The ability to put very, very fine uh, probes in there, take a biopsy and get an immediate diagnosis whether this tissue is cancer or not cancer during your imaging. This is where it's all heading. In other words, you go inside a lumen and remove a tumor at a much, much earlier stage than actually having to remove the organ itself. This is some of the other work we did earlier on use of imaging, and this is fluorescent. You can also use all sorts of other imaging modalities to see of what is normal and what is abnormal. Where is it whole heading? This is the work from Pisa in Italy on some mini miniature robots that you swallow and these things crawl down or they could actually, you can put them out the other way and they go up, okay? And they are for diagnostic purposes. What's fascinating about this, and again, how much science, do you do not, do, what's, what do you call this in Russian? Do you have those at home? No, you don't, okay. Do you have them in the university? Yeah, yeah, we all had them in the university. What's unique about them is the locomotor system. They have the most sophisticated locomotor system. Do you know that? And uh, what do you do? Go and talk to uh, some, of the, some of your colleagues in, uh, in other departments. They'll tell you how sophisticated is their walking system. And if we can learn from these creatures in designing some of these micro-robots, in actual fact, going through the intestinal tract to take some images, but in some cases also providing therapy uh, is a very, very exciting one. You can see how they move here. This is some of the work that the group in Pisa have done, and these are tiny little things that you swallow, uh, or, as I said, you can put them the, the other way. I'm going to tell you something about education training, because we talked about this earlier, you said six years to become a doctor. I said 10 years to become a surgeon. And some of you who may become surgeons, what makes a surgeon? Well, some people say they have brains. It depends. I think most surgeons don't have brains. That's why they do surgery. Perception. We talked about perception earlier. Communication, very important. What used to get surgeons in the past have you ever worked with dinosaur surgeons in the past? Have you ever seen? They walk in, shout and scream. Do you work that? 
yeah, I always laughed when I met people like that because they always were very important. Yeah, but most surgeons now communicate much, much better. Compassion, surgeons have compassion too. The bit that I like to talk about is their dexterity. How could you tell if a surgeon could do what they're supposed to be doing? Now, in the airline industry, as you will know, this is the first airline simulators in the 1940s. This is what simulation is all about. You do know that most old pilots now will never fly a plane before obtaining their license on a simulator. Did you know that? In medicine, that's never been the case. You train on the patient. That's how I was trained. So the whole idea is how do we move into an era in which we can train surgeons to do surgical skills, train before they operate on a real, real patient. And this is some of the work we've been involved in. Most of these are virtual reality simulators, okay? Do you play games, computer games? Yeah? What's your favorite game? Huh? What, PlayStation? Xbox? Which? Okay, I, I, I didn't recognize that one. But really, it's redesigning graphics and some of the data I showed you before to allow young surgeons, and some of you will use this type of technology, in training in endoscopy, in laparoscopy, and other ways. And I'm going to show you some of the data in using this. These are, these are trainees, okay? These are actually medical students who did this study. We had a control group, okay? And then we had a virtual reality train group. Okay? This is their different attempts, first, second, third, and fourth. What's unique about this data, if you look at it, the starting point and the finish point, the starting point from the, uh, the control group versus the starting point for the VR group, the VR group had this big learning curve done in a lab and not on a patient. And if you are a patient, you don't want the learning curve of your surgeons to be on, on you. Yeah? You, you don't care who on who, but it can't be on you. And that is what we are using simulation for. And I think that is how you will train in the future rather than the way I was trained in the past. Now, the other interesting thing, any of you fly in this room? You fly. Oh, fantastic. Do you have a license? Oh, I thought like a passenger. Ah, she's not like a passenger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I did that, few I did that about three times this week. Now, who, pl who, who flies an airplane? Anyone flies an airplane? No? Anyone who knows anyone who flies an airplane? You do? Close to you? Okay. The bit that's important about flying is for every hour you spend on a simulator is equal to half an hour in a real plane. That is something we call transfer eff efficiency or effectiveness ratio. Does that make sense? So it's double. Uh, flying in a plane is equal to double the amount you do on a simulator. In surgery, believe it or not, that was completely the other way around. For every minute spent in the simulator was equal to 2.2 minutes spent in a real operating theater. That was stunning because that reflects we don't actually train people well in the operating theater. They just hang around and watch the master surgeon operate. So very, very important. And for the first time we can demonstrate to policymakers that simulation is very important. Now, how many of you in undergraduate medical school have a clinical skills lab in your course? You do. You go and examine, uh, put up lines, and do all of that, yeah? Very good. Urinary catheter. This is the same thing, but for postgraduate, for surgical training. So, very important data. Now, in my department, every Friday, all the young surgeons will have to spend half a day on these simulators to be training and also to be evaluated. So, what's the next thing I'd like to talk to you about? And that is the diffusion of innovation. 
Uh, and this is what Skolkova meeting was all about, open innovation. The problem we have in life at the moment is that the more innovation is coming out, the evidence base is supported, the more difficult it is to get doctors and nurses to change and take that evidence base into clinical practice. And that's becoming bigger and bigger of a challenge. And it's fascinating because if you look at the uptake of innovation in any other sector, healthcare does the worst. How do we compare with business? Business always takes up innovation. Uh, Technology, unbelievable. Healthcare is usually always behind in the take up of innovation. Why is that important? It's very important that we do something about this. And that is what Skull Covers Meeting was all about. We need to close that gap because if we don't, we have some serious challenges facing us in the next two or three decades. Firstly, our expectations are changing. Secondly, we're all getting older. Those medical students in this room, your life expectancy is 100 now. Did you know that? Well, it's 95 to 100. Every day you live, we're adding five hours to your life. You're all going to get very, very old. And what we need to make sure is that we have a healthcare system that could look after you. Not just to look after you, it's important as I said yesterday at a meeting, technology has added years to our life, but we need to make sure we add life to these years. Does that make sense? Very, very different story. I could, I could keep you alive for a long, long time, but I need to make sure I give you the quality of life that you deserve. And that is a big, big challenge. New treatments, new drugs, new diseases. So, we need to be much better in innovation. We need to have much more effective treatments. We also need to talk about prevention and lifestyle changes. Whoever was smoking, read this again. Prevention and lifestyle. You have to be taking control of your own health. In your era, it won't be the government who will help you with your health. You need to be in control of your own health. Very, very important. Finishing off with some of the technologies which is going to help us to care for patients who are aging is sensing technologies, which has really transformed and created a new delivery system of healthcare, which we call in the UK home care. Have you heard of home care? In other words, caring for a patient at home with full physiological support. And this is the type of ubiquitous monitoring that I'm talking about. And there are a large number of different diseases, mostly in this case being cardiovascular disease. How could you monitor patients with cardiovascular disease at home, but more importantly, predict when they are going to get complications of surgery? And how do you prevent some of these complications before they happen to reduce their hospital readmission? This is the sensor which was developed in Imperial. As you can see, these are the different uh, uh, Attributes of this sensor, very easy to wear, it goes around your neck. I'm wearing another one. Have you seen this one? Do you know what this is? No? Ah, oh, come on, you should know this. This is very cool. Do you know what cool is? Yeah, you're medical students. Now, this tells me the fuel that I've spent today. And I've spent 2,000... 2,793 fuel points. My target is 3,000 a day. And if I don't get 3,000, I get very depressed. And if I'm in hospital in the evening and I'm still far away from 3,000, guess what I do? I take the stairs all the way down. And if I'm going to go to meet someone, I'll walk to beat my target of 3,000. Yeah? Also, it gives you the number of calories I've burnt. Yeah? I've done 1,000 1, calories above 1,500 that I spend. And it also tells me the number of steps. Do you know how many steps I've done in Moscow today? 8,283 steps. Yeah? This is the information you all need if you want to stay healthy. This sensor gives you even more information. It is envisaged... In the next five years, each one of you 
will have a sensor that will measure at least 10 physiological parameters. How much you've walked, what you've burnt, how much you've taken in, what is your heart rate, what is your pulse rate, what is your blood pressure, what's your temperature. That is where we're going into. Now we're doing this, this is some of the ways in which we have been able to measure, if you like, the pulse and the blood pressure changes. And this was an interesting trial which we used in the census. Well, this is one of the earliest trials we did, which is the use of this in patients having hip replacements. Yeah? What we wanted to do is to have the operation and get the patients home quickly as possible. What's the average hospital stay in a hip replacement in, Mos in Russia? Do you know? What is it? I don't know what it is. I'm asking you. I really don't. No. Well, it used to be two weeks in the UK. Two weeks. You stay in hospital. Now, say again? Ten days. Yeah. Ten days, two weeks. Now we are sending patients home in three days. We're getting them up and around, and they have these sort of sensor technologies. And what they do, we can be sitting in the hospital monitoring the patient and how much they're moving in their own environment. We can predict from their movements, whether they're going around, whether they are in their bedroom, sleep all the time, whether they've gone to the loo, whether they've gone downstairs to the kitchen to make a cup of tea, or that they were sitting down watching television. We can monitor all their movements in their home environment, and everything is linked to the wireless telephone on a Bluetooth, and the information goes to the hospital. So, what we can do, we can sit down and look at this patient, okay? He's been in the bedroom, and walking in the corridor, has visited the toilet once, has been in the kitchen a number of times, living room, all good news. This patient is moving. Yeah? That's good. They're not dead. They're alive and they're moving. You look at this patient. Oh, most of the time is in the bedroom and most of the time is in the toilet. There's something wrong with this patient. So what do you do? We send a nurse to see the patient at home. And this patient did have something wrong. They had a a bowel infection from taking antibiotics, something called Clostridium difficile. Have you heard that? That was what's wrong with the patient. We picked that up before the patient went sick enough to be put in an ambulance and brought to hospital. That is what you can do now to patients and their patient uh, recovery. So, when I did surgery, when I first started to do surgery, and I'm not that old, by the way, in case you think I'm very old, I'm not, I'm still very young. Uh, that's, what I, that's what I tell my wife. Uh, and uh, uh, there was a very famous book by another lord called Lord Moynihan. Uh, his name was Barclay Moynihan. And he has, if you like, in surgery, he produced the Bible of surgery. We all had to read that. If you didn't read that, you don't pass the surgical exams. Okay? And his book, and that book still sells, by the way, in his book, if you open the preface, the preface is the first in the beginning. He said in 1930, okay, he said, we can surely never hope to see the craft of surgery made much more perfect than it is today. This great man, the king of surgery, in 1930 said, it's all done now, there's no more new discoveries in surgery. Okay? My only advice to you as you leave this room don't be as blind as he is. Because if you are, you miss all the opportunities of innovation, new discovery that will make a big difference. And it's people like you who will hopefully come up with the new discoveries that will make my operation less painful. And I could go home earlier and, uh, and I wouldn't spend as much time as the toilet as the last patient did. So that's really what you need to think about. Yeah. You don't do research, you don't do clinical practice without a large team. I am the guy who goes around the world and correct, collects the air mile, and the rest of them do the work back at home, yeah? Uh, and there are the different groups in, in the UK. So on that note, I think I've spoken enough. I did say I cannot speak more, more than an hour because I've never done anything in life more than an hour. And uh, so I'm happy to take questions. Thank you.
Questions? Yes, sir. You speaking in Russian or English? Подождите секундочку, я к вам подойду с микрофоном. Where's my thing? Извините. Вот вы говорите о хирургии, говорите, что нет новаций. Новация есть. Например, мы готовы сейчас продать Англии любое лекарство по лечению любой болезни. Легко лечится рак. Любые осложнения сердца легко лечатся. Не надо делать операции на любом органе. Это противоестественно. Значит, мы готовы хоть сегодня э, э, вести диалог с, с руководством э, правительством Англии на реализацию этих патентов. Можно оживлять людей, можно э, дать людям жить более 500 лет. Но э, давайте сделаем это практически, чтобы можно было доказать. Дело в том, что в России, в России... Это сделать невозможно, понимаете? Мы подходили в Академию наук, а, но... Did, did you say you have a magic bullet? Is that what I heard? Do you have a magic treatment? Am I getting right? I didn't get the translation. No, what did you say? If you just I, the translator didn't... Yeah. Uh -huh. A treatment. Yeah, about oh. Well, you should go and talk to Skolkova. Do you want to put that on? Yeah. You should go and talk to Skolkova. Don't tell me the idea. Don't. No, 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 no. This is your idea. You better go and tell them. You write it down. You go to a patent office. Patent office. You register the patent. Это невозможно. Я вам проще объясняю. Оформить. Why is it impossible? Is it a was it a religious thing? What is it? Оформление патента это раскрытие знаний. Патент никто оформлять не будет, потому что открыть патент это все равно, что рассказать свои знания врагам. Okay. So you have a, why do you, you don't want to share your secret? Okay, well, don't share your secret then. Uh, one question. I'd like to live, you, are you going to live for 500 years? Whatever that is. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, one question. Yes, sir. Спасибо за лекцию. Когда когда вы начали курить и когда вы бросили курить? Это вопрос. Да. Потому что молодежь, молодежь смотрит на вас. Yes. I, I started smoking when, uh, actually I was a late starter. I didn't start smoking till about 17 or 18, which is quite late now, if you start smoking. Uh, and uh, and I, was, I became very quickly a fairly serious smoker, uh, smoking a lot of cigarettes actually, till about 30. And that's when I stopped, really. So I smoked for about 11 or 12 years, and, uh, and, and then I found all sorts of ways. The problem with smoking, it's the most addictive thing you can do. And uh, it's in something I was talking yesterday, uh, was it yesterday or the day before? We started in the health service in the UK, smoking cessation things. Have you, do you have these Nicorette things and things? And that's really what got me off it. But, you know, looking back at it, it's probably the worst thing you can do. And uh, it's amazing when you come to, it's my first time to Moscow, but I was to Armenia before uh, for a day. And I tell you, 
the minute I, I've, I've been there four times, the minute you get out of that plane in the airport, everyone smokes. I don't think there's a single Armenian that I've met who doesn't smoke. You don't. And you're Armenian, are you? Yeah. Well, they should, yeah, you don't. I mean, they need to do something about this. They really do. Because we know the evidence base is, uh, uh, and what smoking does to, not just to you and your health, your family, your society, and everything else. So uh, if you're on it, try your best to get off it. It's easier said than done, but get off it. Anyhow, so I've been very honest. Thank you, Lord Darcy, sir, for your lecture. Uh, my question about um, um, your distance uh, uh, healthcare program. Could you tell us uh, more detail about result which you had? Yeah. Well, this is not telemedicine. This is what we call telecare. Uh, and the results clearly showed, as I showed you before, you can actually manage patients at home by having ubiquitous, ubiquitous means wireless way uh, in which you can capture physiological information from that patient without them actively participating in that and transmitting that information to an intelligent system. It doesn't have to be a human, an intelligent algorithm that could give you the early warning signs of a patient developing an infection, patient developing heart failure, arrhythmias. That is what it works for. And I, as I said to you, it won't be long where even normal subjects will have sensing devices. I, I, I explained to you what this does. Uh, this actually is just a big, this is very much the beginning of a very sophisticated set of sensors that could measure everything we do. What's the idea? Well, I think patient. I think I think it will disrupt the way we deliver healthcare. I think people will take more control of their health. People will be more understanding. Uh, I said something this morning. In in the UK, we have 17 million patients with chronic disease. Examples: diabetes, chronic obstructive airway disease. A lot of these patients, asthma. A lot of these patients know most about more about their condition than many other people. If you give them the sensing technologies that they could predict, in which there is a deterioration, they need to get the nebulizer, they need to go for exercise, it dramatically is going to improve, it's going to change the way we deliver healthcare. So the healthcare that used to be delivered in a hospital will be delivered in patients' homes in the community setting. Yeah? Yes. You'll be out of work. That you're right. If you're thinking of being a surgeon, do something else then. Yeah, it doesn't matter how much surgeons make. What matters is whether patients are better. That's the way to think about it. If you really got, get, listen, if you're getting into medicine or surgery to make money, you're in the wrong job. Seriously. If I was you, I'd go and do something else. Be a banker. You're not a surgeon. You a doctor? I'm an engineer. You what? Engineer. Oh, your chances of making money is even higher. <laughs> you just to invent something very quick, and uh, and you will get the money. Seriously, if you're thinking you're going to make money out of doing medicine, you're not. But if you are thinking of being entrepreneur on the side, and that's the bit I'm trying to put in your head, when you see a problem, or keep your eyes open when you're treating a patient, say, could I do this better? Is there a technology that I could design that could make this better? And that's where the ideas come from. And if you come with the ideas like this gentleman here who has an idea that keeps you alive for 500 years, is not telling me about it, don't listen to him, go and register that patent. And that is really what, your, that is your intellectual property. That is the intellectual property of Russia, okay? People who've educated you, uh, and everything else. So that's really how you make the money on the side. But you don't make money out of treating patients. If you do, you do make money, but it's not worth talking about. Like other people will make money. Does that make sense? Anything else? My uh, great friend Vladimir here, who is probably the best facial maxillary surgeon I've seen. 
He doesn't make money treating me. He makes money out of the equipment and the information technology, out of the, the, the new discoveries that he has. I mean, what can he charge me? You know? Anything else? So, uh, that I'm gentleman there. Who is there? Oh, you're there. Okay. We, we need to go to that man there. He's been waiting. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Should, yeah. Okay. Uh, прошу внимания, уважаемые слушатели. Я подхожу к вам с микрофоном, и вы говорите только в микрофон. А попутные не надо этого делать, хорошо? Только перед вопросом поднимайте руку, я обязательно к вам подойду. Окей? So, uh, it will be a little bit strange, but I'm not a doctor, I'm an engineer. Uh, and I have uh, some strange question. Um, do you believe uh, that in some point in the future, uh, so uh, artificial intelligence will replace... Oh, sorry. Surgery. Yeah, I, I was listening to this. I didn't understand what you were saying. Do you believe uh, that in some point uh, in the future, uh, people will be replaced uh, by artificial intelligence, by machines at all? People or doctors? Doctors, yes. Doctors, yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, I think there are certain activities that could be done by lesser intelligent or able or competent people. Does that, does that make sense? Uh, I don't think you will ever replace... Uh, it's interesting, everyone asks me, would you ever get rid of a surgeon and get a technician to do the operation? No, not, not at this stage, but surgery is becoming... Technology is allowing people to do things with less competency. Does that make sense? I had to have much more sophisticated training 10 years ago to do an operation than some of the newer guys which I teach now with all the new technologies available to them. And uh, so I don't think we'll get rid of the medical profession, but I think many, many of the stuff that currently is done by doctors will not be done by doctors. Many of the stuff done by nurses will not be done by nurses. But there's always will be something. It's also interesting if you look at the last 20 years, what we now treat in an intensive care unit, 10 years ago, they would have been dead. What we now treat in a ward used to be treated in an intensive care unit 10 years ago. It's, it's all, that is what technology does. But I don't think it gets rid of people. I mean, but you never know. Did you ever dream that there will be an airplane flying without a pilot? Call the drones, do you know what they are? They do silly things, they do bad things to you. You don't want any drones here. But uh, they are essentially flying machines with bombs in them. Uh, and you probably do know in the next 18 months there's going to be a car coming out which drives without having a driver in it. Which is fantastic for me, so I never have to take the wife with me anymore. The car will drive. <laughs> now that's when they have the rows in the car, isn't it? Either the husband or the wife looking in the map. Yeah. Anyhow, any other questions? There's a gentleman there, yeah. So, uh, tell me, please, uh, what bottlenecks you see in modern medical robotics? Which of them it is necessary to overcome in order to make you happy? To make me happy? No. Yes. I'm always happy. <laughs> uh, what development I would what, like? What to... bottlenecks? Uh, really, uh, the most urgent problems which uh, yeah. uh, it's necessary to... Yeah. I think... I think, well, it's a good question, because I think we're looking at the tip of the iceberg. The robot that I showed you is the first car that Henry Ford produced in the 1920s. Does that make sense? Do you remember when he said you can have every color as long as it's black? Do you remember that statement? Uh, and, and that's what we're looking at. So there's huge development to be done in robotics. Huge, huge, huge. Imaging, some of the instruments could be significantly more refined, more miniature, tactile feedback, making the instruments much smaller. That big thing I showed you, that takes 20 minutes to dress it up by putting the sterile drapes on and everything else. Yeah? And so there's huge amounts still that needs to be done. The problem we have in robotics at the moment is the, there isn't much competition in the marketplace. At the moment, there is one company producing them, and what we need in the next five years, more companies out there, because competition is really what drives innovation and drops the cost. And hopefully, someone in Russia will start producing robotics. I was speaking to 
I can't remember his name, he was the vice president of research in Skolkova earlier. And it seems robotics is part of their research program. They would like to develop a research program uh, in, uh, in robotics. Uh, Any more questions? Uh, yes. Uh, I have a question about that uh, bug like a robot. Huh? Uh, um, you told us about that robot that uh, uh, looks like a bug. A bag? Yeah. And uh, can it actually travel across human gut and collect uh, uh, mucosal samples of microbiota? Oh, the, the mini, mini, miniature robots? Yes. Yes, yes, it can. Yes. So it can just. Uh, it can take a biopsy as well. Oh, yes. Okay. It could take a biopsy. The problem with these is how do you capture them when they come out? So you need to tell the patient to have a, a sieve. Do you know what a sieve is? A filter. Because otherwise you flush the loo, it goes away. Yeah? Okay. Thank you very much for your lecture. Uh, my question is, yeah, it is really amazing, and the question is about this fantastic technique of making surgery from inside the body, from the stomach, and the question is, how do you prevent infection being spread? Very good, very good Thank point, you. yeah. Uh, well, the answer is, you can, you try your best to clean the gastrointestinal tract, but you can, all, you can never 100% sterilize it. We use antibiotics during the operation, uh, infection has never, never been an issue. The issue is when you make the hole in the stomach or the vagina and you come out, you need to close that hole. Because if you don't, you're going to get a leak. And that's when the difficulties arise. The three cases we've done, we haven't had a single infection. Absolutely not. And there are more bacteria in the vagina than there is in the mouth. So, yeah. Yes. So we have, thank you, we have kind of nest of questions here. And my question is also about notes. Notes, uh, yeah. Yeah, you know, these days, even my course mates and people young like me, they feel kind of sarcastic about notes. And I think they feel the same as maybe your colleagues felt about laparoscopic surgery 30 sure. years ago. Yeah. So what do you think about its um, perspectives? Well, I don't know. The jury is out. Do you, know, do you use that term here? The jury is out. In other words, we haven't made a decision whether it's the right thing or the wrong thing. Uh, in keyhole surgery, it was very clear. It made a huge, huge difference. But in, in, uh, in this type of surgery, no. We, 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 the reason we're doing it because we're developing a platform of different instruments. Uh, we think intranuminal surgery will take on big time, but I'm not sure about complete notes, to be honest. I really don't think we have any evidence to suggest it is better or more cost effective. And I think the one thing you need to learn in medicine as well, in surgery, is you don't do things for the sake of doing them. They have to be better, uh, and they have to be cost-effective too. Not just effectiveness. We're living in a world that people will ask you, why are you doing this twice the cost without the added benefits? Who's next? Thank you very much for the lecture. I'm going to ask Russian. Hello. 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 Спасибо большое. У меня вопрос более технический. Имеется ли у вас технологии сейчас совмещения... Имеется ли у вас технология совмещения моделей, полученных с МРТ, КТ, совмещение для дополненной реальности и управление скальпеля, позиционирование его непосредственно на человеке при операции. Есть ли у вас такие технологии? Well. I, I don't, but I could tell you it, is, it, 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 it does exist. Anything that has a 3D data set, which is what tomography has, uh, and uh, any form of imaging with the 3D data sets, you can actually augment uh, with a video as long as you have the points of registration. If you have the points of registration, you can do image augmentation. It doesn't matter how many sources of imaging you could put together. What gets more complicated is 
the more sources you put together, the more the person's, the brain interpretation of that would be even more challenging. Uh, so you need to define what, what is the purpose? Why are you trying to achieve that? Are you trying to look at anatomical areas? Are you trying to establish histological diagnostics? Whatever it happens to be, but you can augment anything. But you need to make sure that what you're displaying is something that's meaningful that the person could interpret. Yeah? Right. Спасибо за прекрасную лекцию. Два вопроса, может быть, как один они представляют. Готов ли рынок, с вашей точки зрения, в Западной Европе и, ну, скажем так, всей Америке, к тому, что вы показали? И второй вопрос, не будет ли ситуация, ну, мы про закон Мура помним, через два года у нас удвоение скоростей и объемов памяти. Не будет ли, как в Форде, скупка всех технологий электромобилей и заморозка их на уровне на 40-50 лет? Спасибо. Okay. I, uh... Well, let, let me answer the first question. Is the, is the market ready for them? Yeah, I mean, the healthcare market has always been, but you need, the problem with the healthcare market is the regulatory framework. Regulation is becoming more and more complicated. In the US, for example, the FDA, I don't know whether you so recently, there was a 200, I bet, I think 200 different CEOs of medical devices companies, small startups, wrote, to the FDA to say their recent changes in regulations will destroy their business. Or they're going to Europe to get the approval of their devices. So there are issues with the FDA. Europe is a little bit more open and less regulated in evaluating medical devices. So once you get through the medical devices evaluation, then it's easy enough to get into a marketplace. I think the second question the economic bit was quite important. And I agree with you, and I said that this morning. You know, the healthcare systems are looking for low-cost, high-impact innovations. That's what they're looking for, uh, rather than high-cost, low-impact innovations. I think high-cost, low-impact innovations is not going to make a difference in the future. So anything I've showed you is not good enough anymore to show this is better. It needs to be better, but cheaper too. That's the way to think about it. If you're thinking about inventing something, okay, go and think about something that is better and cheaper. Спасибо за лекцию. У меня следующий вопрос. Удалось. Спасибо за лекцию. Вопрос следующий. Удалось ли при использовании робототехники уменьшить продолжительность операции? То есть, если мы берем, в пример, использование просто традиционной лапароскопии и при использовании робота да Винчи, при, испол... при выполнении каких-то стандартных операций, как холецистоктомия, ну, то есть то, что э, реально выполнить хирургами лапароскопически. Спасибо. Yeah. Again, good question. When you start any form of new surgery, when we started keyhole surgery, it took longer than open surgery. Ten years later, keyhole surgery is much quicker than open surgery. If you talk about robotics, when we first started, robotics took longer than keyhole surgery. I think it is still longer because not the operative bit is longer. It's actually preparing the robot takes a long time. As I told you, it's like asking a lady to dress up to go for dinner. You have to dress it all up, has to put the makeup on, and then start the operation. Does that make sense? That takes about half an hour, and there's no way we can get rid of that unless we make the machine smaller. Hello. Um, I'm a student of Sechen of University, I will ask in English. Oh, and uh, my question is about um, possibilities of robotics. Um, uh, is it possible or do people use it now um, to, you, uh, to use robots uh, in operation in faraway regions, in uh, war regions, yeah. when uh, a surgeon will operate uh, by remote control? Yeah. Thank good. you. Very, very good question. In actual fact, 
Some of the early funding for this type of work came from an organization called DARPA, which is some defense agency in, in the US. And this whole concept of master-slave was very much to allow a surgeon to be in a safe place and operate on a soldier in a war zone. Uh, and that's really how the funding started. Uh, and, and I could see the advantages of that in, in the defense arena. Except very quickly, they discovered in the wars that we're fighting at the moment, uh, you don't need to send soldiers. You just send missiles or drones. That's all what you do now. We don't send soldiers. We, we did, I think after Afghanistan, no one is going to send any soldiers anywhere uh, because it's too dangerous. So would it work in civil society? I don't think so. The idea that I am going to have a patient in, uh, in Newcastle or Moscow want me to operate while I'm in London I don't think morally, you know, the patient will get into a plane and come all the way to London to get it done or whatever. Uh, I think though there might be some advantages, for example, if I'm doing an operation in London, a surgeon from Moscow may log in and help me do an operation. Does that make sense? But I don't think we, any patient in his right mind will say, okay, I'll lie on a, on a table with a robot machine around me and the surgeon is going to be sitting in London. That's, that's, unless you want to, you might be the first. Pleasure. My question is about uh, Matt's modeling of blood flow and surgery. Do you think that it could be useful for making or planning operations and uh, is there any specific for robotic surgery? I really didn't understand the question. I'm sorry, unless oh. I'm, I'm <laughs> getting late in the evening. What mm. say it again? Uh, so the question is uh, that... Uh, modeling. Modeling. We have met modeling of blood flow in, uh, yes, in some blood parts vessels. of the whole um, yeah. human body. Yeah. And uh, um, I think that it could be useful yeah. for planning uh, operations. Oh, absolutely. Do you think so? Oh, completely. And do you have some uh, yeah, yeah. examples? Well, we do it in virtual reality simulators. We can uh, actually do a patient specific planning and simulation. But not only for training, but no, 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 for, for, for playing planning. real yes, operations. Yes, yes, absolutely. I mean, now we can take some of the complicated, I mean, to be honest, uh, go up to, if you use an iPhone or iPad, there's a software called Orvis. You can download for free. Mm -hmm. It's Swedish, Scandinavian software. You can link up your, you can link it up to your computer, feed the CT images into it. I mean, Vladimir will tell you and you can immediately reconstruct. He, he put eight implants in my mouth, eight. And he did all the planning on a computer screen. So, That's a good example. Yeah. Right in here, stand, yeah. Well, it's your lecture, I can't. No, 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 yeah. Eight implants, is it eight implants you put in my mouth? Yeah, something like that. And they were very close to each other. All of that was planned well before the operation. I'm here, I'm okay, sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, in one of your slides, you have shown, uh, you, uh, you have shown time lag of uh, healthcare development uh, in comparison to other sectors. Yes, to, uh, to other technologies. What is the measure of, of health uptake. care quality? What's the measure of uptake? Yes. Well, uh, the measure usually is having metrics that will compare practice to the gold standard. I'll give you an example. In stroke care in London, uh, in 2006, I did a major review of London's healthcare. London has about seven, eight, seven, seven million. It's about, uh, it's, it's about two thirds the size of Moscow by the looks of things. 
And we were spending, we had 32 hospitals doing stroke care. And none of them were meeting the international guidelines. And we were spending as much money in stroke care as the whole of Sweden was put together. And we looked very carefully, and none of them were. They didn't have enough volume. They didn't have enough guidelines. They didn't have any expertise to provide 24-hour call, seven. You know, that's, a stroke doesn't happen at 9 o'clock in the morning or 5 o'clock in the evening. Stroke happens any time of the day. And to have a full, dedicated team is quite an expensive thing to do. And even if you had the money, we don't have enough doctors and nurses trained to provide that. So we shrank that into four, five comprehensive stroke centers. And the, meeting the, in, the guidelines or the metrics is significantly. So we have ways of measuring that now. And, uh, and, and not only measuring input, but also measuring outputs, the outcome because we know we have more patients with stroke, surviving stroke, leaving hospital without a stick than we did before. And their quality of life is much, much better. So we can measure these things, and we can now, in, and we are living in an era of transparency. You know, I, when I was a health minister, I introduced this thing called quality accounts. So every hospital, like a business, publishes its business accounts, its financial set of accounts, we also get them to measure their quality accounts. And in these quality accounts, it will say 80% of our patients who came in with stroke, we did met the five international guidelines in stroke. And it's by law, I took that piece of legislation through parliament, it's by law that they have to publish this. So patients will know what is what. If you have iPhones, you can go to iTunes and download a free app called Dr. Darcy, well known by Dr. Darcy. Yeah? It won't work in Russia, but if you're in London, it will tell you the nearest hospital to you and how do they rate. It will give you the ratings of every hospital in England. Not only what, how many guidelines they meet, but also what the patients think, and also provides you with the option of you voting for that hospital, whether it's good or bad. That's the era we're going into. When you go to a restaurant in London, you check on the star rating and see how many stars it has. You know, Vladimir only eats a three Michelin star. I can't go. One, one is enough for me. Uh, you go to a hospital, you don't know what stars the hospital has. It's the luck of the draw. You pick up the phone every day, every day of the week, I'm out, someone says to me, is this hospital any good? Is this surgeon any good? That's not the way it should be. It's an era of transparency. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Spoken too much. How are we doing on time? I need a vodka soon. Uh, I have a question for you. Speaking about law regulations, um, if something goes wrong, uh, when this uh, micro robot is robot, inside, yeah. micro robot is inside the patient. Who yep. is to blame? The company it, uh, it was produced by, or yep. a doctor, or yep. a freelancer? Yeah. Well, made the rule number one. Them? Rule number one: You can never blame the technology. If a monkey cannot dance, <laughs> you can't blame the floor. Have you heard that? <laughs> yeah. Have you heard that before? And there are many monkeys, male monkeys, who don't know how to dance. They blame the floor. So it's always you uh, is the most. But let me, it's a good question because I, it happened to me once. And the, and the whole robot, the whole system froze. And it was like a computer crash. I went out, I, I, I called this guy, the technician, to see what I should do because nothing started to work anymore. And he gave me the same advice as your IT manager will give you in the university. He said, go outside, wherever the plug is, switch it off, take the plug out, put it back in, switch it on again. And I did that, and the computer came back. It's a computer, seriously. I'm not sure whether it's a Windows system or a Mac. Yeah. Yes. Hands up, I can't see you. Question, yeah. Oh, yes, 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 yes. No, sit down, sir, yes. Очень приятно встретиться с таким энтузиастом, который умеет популярно 
интересно рассказывать о такой сложнейшей области. Уважаемый профессор, я как журналист, я не хирург и не медик, но работаю в медицинской прессе. Мне посчастливилось, скажем, рассказывать, беседовать с профессором Пушкарем, который увлеченно рассказывал мне о использовании робототехники в урологической практике. Скажите, пожалуйста, по вашей оценке, вот помимо лондонского опыта, где еще, в каких странах есть интересное продвижение в этой области? И второе, как вы оцениваете возможности российских, российской медицины во внедрении вот этой прогрессивной и перспективной области в медицине? Спасибо. Okay. Thank you for that. And, well, I think clinically a lot of centers now are doing robotic surgery. There's nothing new about that. It's about 12 years down the line. However, there are very few centers doing proper research for the new areas of robotics. And that's mostly, uh, there's some work done in the west coast of America. There's, we are very, very well funded. We are funded to the tune of 10 million a year in robotic. Uh, we, we got big, big, huge grants in supporting our robotics work. So the research is going extremely well. Uh, where, and, and the research will help us with the next generation robots because if you remember, I said earlier, we're looking at the tip of the iceberg. We really are. Where, does, where is Russian surgery? I mean, Russian surgery has an amazing heritage uh, you, and, and you should be very, very proud of. Uh, many, many surgical procedures, textbooks, uh, and different uh, instrumentations have contributed to the, the scientific know-how in surgery globally. Uh, where are you now? I, I know there is a huge amount of reform happening in the healthcare system, and I'm sure more could be done. Uh, and uh, so you should be very proud of what you've had, and I'm sure you will continue that. Uh, the discussions I've had with Skolkova the last two, two days has been mostly about, you know, how do we bring more innovation into healthcare, including surgery. But we need good reporters like you to report good scientific discoveries. Right? And the last questions. Okay. I have a follow-up question about stroke management. Um, ah. I'm an investor and an entrepreneur in medical device development, and I'm looking at a technology that is a transcranial, fully portable uh, imaging modality that can go into an ambulance to manage stroke. So obviously, time to needle is a critical thing to get to TP administrator yeah. as soon as possible. If we can transmit the image from an ambulance while we're en route, can we get to a point where we can uh, commence thrombolytic administration in an ambulance? Or is that too complex a decision to relegate it to the first responder? Good point, good question. And uh, I think, I don't know, I'm, have you invested in this technology yet? You're thinking about it? You're thinking about it. Okay, well, what you need to know in an ambulance is whether this patient has an embolic stroke or a hemorrhagic stroke. That's the question. That's the million dollar question. So you don't need a sophisticated thing. If you can find a way of differentiating between the two by a very simple algorithm that tells the ambulance driver and the, and the ODA in the ambulance, it's green, meaning it's embolic. You need to go and get the catheter in and the TPA is the thing that dissolves the clot. That's great. If it's red, that means don't go near this patient because he's hemorrhaging and you need to sort out other problems. In other words, give him a blood pressure tablet. Uh, that's all what you need. I really mean that. Because the reason that will turn the ambulance into an intelligent ambulance. What you need the ambulance is to get the diagnostic right. I am not a great enthusiast of enthusiastic of starting the treatment there. Uh, the only treatment that is worthwhile, obviously if a patient has a cardiac arrest, if a patient is bleeding, then I could see all of that. 
but actually putting TPA in an ambulance needs a little bit more than just a, because you're talking about an interventional procedure in a moving vehicle without proper CT or MRI, and you don't want to go there. I, so you need a device, and these devices, whether it's a transcranial Doppler, is probably what you're talking about, uh, could very easily tell you it's this or that. That's all what you need. And that will help also reconfigure hospital services. Because what you need the ambulance driver to know, if it's green, there are four places to go. At the moment, the ambulance goes to the nearest hospital, which is no good to you. Uh, there are many places where I have, uh, one day I may get this tattooed on my chest somewhere. You know, if I have this condition, don't go there, go to this place or go to that place. So you don't want to go to the nearest hospital because they may not have a, a TPA treatment. You want the diagnosis made in the ambulance, so the ambulance says, okay, you need to go to this place, and this place is not the nearest, but is the best place for you. On that note, thank you all very, very much. I'd love to meet you all, and uh, good luck in your medical school, and, uh, and uh, enjoy the evening.